All right. So um, thanks, guys, for inviting me to chat a little bit about my experience, um, just to give you all some background. Um, I previously worked for Harford County for eight years as a critical area planner. Um, after that experience, uh, worked for Cecil County for, for four years. And uh, now, now I'm here in the town of Charlestown. I've been here about a year now. Um, on, on slide two, Mike is, uh, I guess, where we're at. Um, I guess the main thing I wanted to get across to everybody, uh, and, you know, just as background and uh, kind of in the beginning, my, my years of experience, I think, have instilled in me um, kind of the two main goals that I take away from, from the critical area program. And it's, um, um, I'll say, uh, multifaceted regulations. Um, we're, you know, we have these regulations because we're always trying to improve water quality and enhance wildlife development or wildlife habitat, no matter what kind of development might be uh, proposed um, and no matter what kind of condition the, the land might be in uh, to start uh, before development. So uh, uh, next, please. So in Charlestown, just to give you some background uh, about us, the population's around 1,500. Uh, we are primarily residential. Uh, we have two restaurants and four marinas, an elementary school, a fire company, and a and a church. And uh, um, the rest of us is uh, primarily, uh, I'll, I'll even say, uh, single-family residential use. Um, part of what makes Charlestown, I think, a little unique is is its historic nature. Um, I think we have visions of one day becoming more like Colonial Williamsburg uh, because of our colonial history that has been preserved uh, pretty neatly, and in, in, in especially within our uh, National Register Historic District in, in the downtown. Um, what also makes us kind of unique is we have some some natural beauty uh, along the river. We have five uh, we have five parks that are held within in a Maryland Environmental Trust easement. And if you, I think if you looked at one park by itself, um, I don't know if that would typically be be placed in that sort of protective easement with with MET. But because we have five of them in a row, rough of, roughly, uh, I'll say, three or four block area, uh, a stretch of shoreline, I think uh, the MET viewed value in, in preserving them kind of as a group. So we have lots of 100-foot uh, buffer, I'll say, uh, that we are, are stewards of, and uh, we're always balancing, you know, preserving uh, nature and, and trying to enhance wildlife habitat as well as providing uh, public access that uh, I think folks in town but throughout the region have, have come to appreciate. Um, I think most towns on the call probably have heard about the Sustainable Community Program through the State Department of Housing and Community Development. I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, that's a great program. Uh, we do also have a green team here in town, which is fun to be a part of, because uh, there's always projects to do. There's always land to try to improve. Um, and then uh, finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the Arbor Day Foundation. Uh, it's a program, Tree City USA. We, we are striving to meet those four criteria, um, you know, maintaining a, a tree board and having some kind of a community tree ordinance. I do believe uh, the critical area regulations themselves qualify for that ordinance. Um, I can tell you we certainly do spend at least $2 per capita on taking care of our trees and uh, I'll say developed woodlands and forests. And we do uh, look to hold a uh, an Arbor Day event wherever possible. So uh, next, please. And this is just an example of what I think is kind of unique 
in Charlestown that we try to do is uh, in thinking about trying to create events that are attractive, not just to residents, but to folks in the region, trying to combine two um, interesting, uni unique aspects of town. There's a green team sponsored event we held uh, last year, com just combining uh, a little bit of historic preservation, uh, a, a tour that involved a little bit of historic preservation and horticulture. Um, and when we have professionals combining forces to put on an event like that, we think it's it's uh, pretty enriching. Uh, next. So just to talk a little bit about sustainable community, um, there's a map there, I think, the latest towns and cities that are in the program. Um, really, I, th I think it incentivizes good planning when you get this designation. It usually is just a portion of the town. Um, just as an example, one, one program that's set up, uh, once you get this revitalization designation established, is um, facade improvement. So, and I think that's something uh, we can all appreciate. Um, the last bullet there in regards to uh, the program is, um, you know, we're trying to make sure growth and development practices protect the environment, conserve air, water, and energy resources, encourage walkability and recreation opportunities. Next. And just as part of that plan, um, th there's different themes, you know, related to environment is just an example here, um, but, you know, related to transportation, uh, land use, housing. In our environment theme, we, that's why the, the there's a photo there, the scolding finger. We, we kind of tell ourselves uh, what we plan to do over the next five years, right? And it's good to remember uh, remember these things and to revisit them often uh, as a team. Um, first project there, or first uh, strategy rather, is uh, implementing green infrastructure projects so that we can create some demonstration projects, and not just at our parks. Uh, our elementary school is a green school, uh, so they are also partnering with us on these sorts of projects. Um, our, our church and our fire company, I would view as other institutions where we're trying to do more of these um, and when i say green infrastructure i mean um you know like a rain garden which is not uh, too big or uh, too deep that it would require uh, under drains or, or complicated engineering and pipes um, cisterns and even just conservation landscaping a wildflower meadow or um, tree plantings um, and there, there are two types. Uh, I'll get into the other type of green infrastructure below. But um, next strategy, we tell ourselves to not forget. Oh, sorry, uh, Mike. <laughs> not the next slide yet. Um, next bullet on this slide is just um, we have a public boat ramp in town, as well as a uh, public dock. And our fire company has a fire boat dock. All three of those water-dependent facilities need dredging from time to time, and we know we'll want to maintain those and, you know, in perpetuity. What can we do with those spoils that are removed from maintaining those three facilities over time? Um, we're hopeful that since we have five waterfront parks and we're trying to preserve um, their shorelines, we may be able to reuse some of those spoils for for living shorelines and again, as demonstration projects, ways to protect your land without uh, armoring the shoreline, typically what's done with the uh, riprap and revetment. Um, we are the third bullet there. We are continuing to try to improve the management of our parks, uh, creating those native plant demonstration gardens, I'll call them, uh, wherever possible. Also, um, to help reduce nuisance flooding wherever we can. Uh, we we certainly we're an older town and we don't have uh, an elaborate stormwater management system. So there's areas where uh, pieces are missing, and we may be able may be able to help uh, develop runoff away from um, private properties that are flooded. Just within our road right of way, putting in a swale or maybe a pipe into a 
uh, one of our parks where we have a little bit more land to help uh, store that that runoff, uh, the, the volume of that runoff. Um, we certainly do want to try to create incentives for folks to do these sorts of green stormwater infrastructure projects on their own properties. We don't have, I know some towns have uh, stormwater utility fees. We don't have anything like that. So, you know, what are our options if we'd like to get uh, folks to do more of these projects? We, we start with just, the, uh, you know, having conversations with folks. Well, maybe it's, you know, it's like street cred or peer pressure, you know, if your neighbor's doing it, maybe, maybe, you know, you should do it too. Um, so we're, in, you know, I don't know if we'll get to a point where we may actually reduce people's property taxes for, for doing projects, but we, wait, we may, so we'll see how that goes. Um, next bullet is regarding the green infrastructure network. This is, you know, if you're looking at it at a regional level, basically an interconnected system of, of forests and floodplains, uh, hydrology. We feel like even in town, uh, you can look at these sorts of networks. Oftentimes counties establish them and uh, they don't exclude the towns when they do those sorts of regional studies. So if you look at that within your town, you know, are there things that we can do to um, kind of take maybe some of the critical, critical area regulations and apply it to this network outside of the 1,000 foot boundary, uh, just clearing limits and, and mitigation requirements, basically. Because we do feel like it's an important part of our uh, town fabric. And then lastly is just, uh, again, long range plans that we have, trying to incorporate some of these strategies into them, especially the, I know the comprehensive plan is kind of like an encyclopedia, uh, but whenever we I looked update, even if it's just sections of it, not a wholesale update, but just sections that we try to look to incorporate these elements related to green infrastructure, nuisance flooding, and also hazard mitigation. Next. So back to the 100 foot buffer. Um, in my mind, it's, you know, it's not just that, uh, like what Mike was showing earlier, the 100 foot buffer from the river and uh, tidal wetlands, but the creeks that drain into the river, um, especially as waterfront towns, I know we, we have two or three or four of them. Um, I think it's important to uh, try to maintain or try to become a riparian forest buffer along those areas as well. And it's not just, you know, the, the buffer regulations tend to be the most strict, uh, and it's not just to protect wildlife it's to uh, I think there's benefits here I've listed uh, for us humans too you know trees are good in, in a lot of different ways and, and also I'd say forest in general um, things we I think we need to remind ourselves you know how important they are you know it can reduce traffic sounds uh, cools the air reduces energy costs uh, can increase property values I think it improves our mental and physical health and absorb some of the carbon dioxide in the air. And I think it mitigates the effects of climate change. So whatever we can do to try to improve the 100 foot buffer, no matter what condition it might be in, and even if it's just planting a tree in, in lawn, uh, I think there are benefits for, for all of us. Uh, next. So even in, uh, whatever we want to call them, the modified buffer areas is, is what I labeled it as. Um, again, there's there's room for improvement there. Um, I know in Charlestown, we actually have a, a 50 foot setback, uh, which is basically considered a, a non-disturbance zone. And we know because it's a modified buffer area that uh, there could already be some disturbance there, but to kind of come at it from a mindset of uh, when new developments proposed, what can we do to um, improve the modified buffer areas as well? And I think it's, you know, you're trying to keep development out of that 50 foot setback if, if at all possible. And if there is development that you, um, you know, try to establish that 50 foot setback. And when I say establish, that means try to direct your uh, tree and shrub and any kind of mitigation landscaping into that zone. I, I know it's a real popular question um, 
you know, when a when a resident might first learn about the the critical area program, and they say, "Oh, I have to plant a tree because I'm taking down a hazard tree," or I have to, um, you know, put in some trees and shrubs because I'm I'm building a, a shed. Uh, wh where should I put it on my property? You know, they often ask us that, right? And um, I think the common answer is, you know, wherever it, or maybe the safest answer, I should say, is wherever it, uh, it could go on your property that would make you the most happy to live with in the future, right? Um, but I think we always want to try to give that guidance to help help folks realize the importance of that, of the buffer, and try to try to do that landscape and mitigation there if, if they can, and, they, and they'd be happy with it. Um, I remember working on a, a project that was in Cecil County where the house is really close to the river and it was a steep slope. It was, uh, it was basically a retaining wall that was almost 20 feet tall and they had their dock down below and there was really not much room um, as part of replacing that retaining wall to do their landscape and mitigation. So they, they had actually asked if they could do uh, rain gardens instead. Um, I just think that's an interesting thing to consider and, and probably should be in, in local uh, programs or regulations that as an option. You know, folks just can't fit their landscape and mitigation in the buffer on that site. Could they do some kind of stormwater BMP instead? Um, and uh, on the photo here, I, I, I think there are values in installing rain gardens, even if it's just a, a small depression in the ground with a little berm on the downhill side of it. It doesn't have to be engineered and, um, you know, you replace it with some soil that'll infiltrate and put some plants on top. I, I do think that there's value in installing those um, even on small, small sites. And then I, I do know in our uh, critical area ordinance, we do accept a, a fee in lieu. Sometimes there's uh, development projects that just, again, because of site constraints, can't fit the mitigation on there. Uh, they end up having to pay a fee in lieu. I know uh, we allow that in modified buffer areas as well as in the LDA section of the critical area. And that can become a good funding source uh, for towns to use uh, on their parks when they're trying to um, naturalize them. Next. And with the 10% the rule, I know in Charlestown, most of our uh, critical, critical area designation is IDA. Um, so 10% rule comes up all the time. We had um, uh, a project I'll get into in a little bit where we preferred planting trees instead of putting in stormwater practices. So it's kind of vice versa. If you have um, the room to put in trees, at, at uh, for example, one of our parks, that could be an option to consider too. And and just to remember that the environmental site design, the, the stormwater regulations, uh, even though there can be some intense engineering involved, it's meant to mimic woods in good condition. So um, again, just to kind of reinforce, I'd say the importance of, of forest and developed woodlands wherever possible. Next. This is the uh, uh, one out of our four or five uh, natural parks along the river. We just purchased from a marina uh, about 10 years ago. So um, we've been actively naturalizing it. Our green team spends a lot of time on it. There's actually uh, this Saturday, October 1st, coming up in two weeks, uh, Cecil Cares Day for this year. It's a community or a countywide day of service. This is where we'll be focusing our efforts, um, cleaning up debris, maintaining the gardens, and planting some additional trees and shrubs. Not for this particular project, but for um, it's just something we, we want to continue doing. But for this particular project, we put in two gravel parking lots. The the upper parcel is where our boat trailers park. We use our public boat ramp. The parking lot down below is near uh, an entertainment stage that we have. Um, and so as mitigation for the parking lots, 
again, it's the the ten percent ten percent rule kicks into play. There's the ESD spreadsheet that you need to think about as far as uh, the footprint of the development and how much uh, nutrient pollution uh, removal we're trying to get. And then just to do a calculation, we, we had figured out how many trees and shrubs we needed to plant to satisfy that uh, requirement. So the fun thing about that is, and these trees are all on the ground now, but just um, last Arbor Day in April, uh, we partnered with the fifth graders at the elementary school uh, to plant the trees. So that was our Arbor Day event for the year. And we'll, you know, we're always looking for Arbor Day events. Next. Again, with uh, Avalon Park, we're, we're naturalizing. Um, we're still holding events there. That's a picture of our stage. Um, you know, still maintaining the park uh, for public use, but also taking care of it from a uh, natural habitat standpoint. Uh, we do, we've hired, I, I know the town of Northeast, and I think the city of Havit of Grace uh, used Jody Shivery. Her, her company is called Ecologically Sound Landscapes. And I can't stress enough how important it is to find a really good gardener uh, in your area to help you take care of your parks. Um, you know, not only is Jody a licensed herbicide applicator, but she's really passionate about uh, getting rid of the bad plants and spreading more of the good plants. And when I say good plants, I mean native bad is obviously the invasives. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm hoping that residents will start to appreciate the turnover uh, in, in our parks. Um, you know, seeing this sort of natural environment uh, thriving. It's, it, you know, we're going to try to continue to educate folks about it, but um, visually, I think folks uh, can appreciate natural beauty. So, one thing I, I want to emphasize us towns, I think we, we have a really good opportunity. I know we talk to our residents a lot. You know, we send them utility bills, we send them newsletters and email blasts and uh, I just think we have a really good opportunity to maybe change some of our residents' behaviors in, in that sort of natural habitat regard and, uh, I'd say, appreciation of, of native plants. Uh, next. And one thing, uh, just to follow up on the, the dredge spoils uh, strategy that we have for ourselves, uh, we are looking at this particular park to possibly use some of those spoils for a living shoreline project. Um, you know, not only could it kind of create an interesting little uh, fishing fishing access uh, and habitat right there, but it's a more sustainable way, we think, to preserve the shoreline. The, you can see there's a bulkhead to the northwest there. Um, that section where we want to put the living shoreline is that uh, is a section of bulkhead that, that's actually failing. So we have to do something about it. Um, and it's just a matter of time, I think, till we get the stars to align to get our funds together to to do a demonstration project like that. We're excited to um, get that under our belt. Next. Uh, just to reiterate, you know, I think the importance of green infrastructure planning, I think counties are doing this, trying to preserve the corridors across the region. Um, Take a look at them, you know, when you can find that data, take a look at them in your town and see what you can do to help keep them intact or, or enhance them. Uh, next. Uh, the town is excited now. It's involved with a uh, watershed master plan. We received some funding from DNR's Chesapeake and Coastal Service. Um, you'll see in the middle of that, that's a 12-digit Water uh, sub watershed, the, the black boundary, and then the town, and that's about eight square miles. That study area, the town's only two square miles. And if you look even closer at it, there's probably only three creeks that, from outside of town, actually drain drain through the town. Um, but we're interested in um, you know analyzing the future impacts of, uh, we'll say, extreme precipitation. And what that looks like, not only on the surface when you're looking at that eight square mile study area, but also 
within the town, the, the subsurface, the, the stormwater pipes that we have, because we easily, we easily see the nuisance flooding in towns related to our drainage system. And I know a lot of it is just unclogging the pipes, but um, understanding what else we might be able to do to uh, reduce that nu nuisance flooding, not, not just on town roads, but also uh, private properties. So um, we'll be partnering with a firm uh, Dewberry, who's done this sort of modeling in the past for uh, adjacent jurisdictions, and part of this uh, part of this plan, uh, it's going to help us identify restoration projects uh, that we can put in the ground to help help reduce that flooding, and also just think about our current stormwater and, and floodplain regulations. Um, and you know, are there areas of I'll say that green on the map there? That is the green infrastructure network. Are there uh, creative ways for us to uh, preserve that land so that it continues to stay intact? And because being intact helps reduce future flooding. Um, even though we know a lot of that is outside of the county, we're gonna we're gonna bring the county along with us on this particular study. Uh, to have some of those conversations about, I'll say, green infrastructure network preservation, but also um, putting in maybe some detention basins higher up in the in the watershed to help reduce the flow of water downstream. Uh, next, again, I think something that happens at the uh, regional or the county level is nuisance flooding. Uh, there are strategies in those plans that I think we should keep in mind. Um, Next, I see we're running out of time. I'm gonna to try to wrap up here. Um, natural floodplains too, I think what we have to remember is they're important community assets, kind of like the 100 foot buffer. Uh, I, I wish we had more uh, regulations as far as leaving them in their natural state where they're not already developed or uh, making them more natural uh, when they are developed. So I think uh, Mike, that's it. My next slide says, thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate you listening to me chat. Thanks, Brian. That was that was great. Um, really, really appreciate you taking the time to put this presentation together and share it with everyone. And um, I, I thought there was just a lot of excellent information there, uh, particularly just, you know, what what um, planner can do at the town level. I, I always personally feel like, um, you know, towns are kind of on the front line of, of what we can do um, for critical area programs. And, and I think we can see some of the uh, most direct impacts of, of preservation and conservation um, at the town level. And, and we're looking at stuff like stormwater management and, um, you know, doing these projects in parks to help combat shore erosion control, you know, do shore erosion control projects. You see that the effects of it um, quickly at a town level. Um, so thanks for that. And uh, um, definitely a lot in there to chew on. Um, I know this is being recorded, but we can also send out this PDF to anybody who's uh, interested in uh, having Brian's presentation. So with that, we still have a few minutes left and um, I just wanted to open up the floor to any questions or comments uh, people may have about anything I covered earlier or anything Brian touched on, if you have any questions for him. I, uh, it's Bruna here with the city of Baltimore. I have one quick question for Brian. Um, I saw the watershed master plans there. Are you guys in the CRS program? Unrelated question, like to critical area, but you're muted, Brian. Sorry, um, we are not in the CRS program, but we would love to be. And we know that that plan will get us some points if we do, so <laughs> that's points. one of our goals. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, we so the city of Baltimore is trying to pursue that uh, for a class four. So maybe we can connect offline to talk about that. Thank you. Great work there. Thanks. Thanks, Bruno. Did anybody else have any follow up questions or comments? If not, um, I want to thank Brian once again. Um, this 
recording should be posted on our website in the relatively near future. If anybody wants a, a copy of, of the slides that uh, we presented, so you can uh, kind of dive deeper into some of the projects that Brian mentioned or any of the information that I brought up during my presentation about the regs, please let me know, or you can just reach out to your um, contact here at the commission. Our next presentation, I believe, is going to be taking place on uh, Thursday, October 20th, and um, that will be hosted by Annie, and we'll have more information coming out on that in terms of agenda and uh, what to expect. So hopefully we'll see you all there. Thanks again for taking time out today and attending the training.